have Jacob Hansel. He's a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, studying ectomycor ectomycorrhizal trees and fungi in the Kickapoo Valley. He teaches introductory biology labs, and during the summer of 2023, he was one of six recipients of UWL's Dean's Distinguished Fellowship. He earned a Bachelor of Science in Biology, Plant, and Fungal Concentration at UW La Crosse in 2022. He has attended college at UW Milwaukee, UW Waukesha, Coastal Carolina Community College, and University of North Dakota. Prior to beginning his academic career, Jacob served honorably in the United States Marine Corps for nine years as a meteorological and oceanographic analyst forecaster with two tours to Helmand Province, Afghanistan. Jacob currently lives east of Lafarge which is with his wife and three children. So please welcome Jacob Hansel. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as I said, I'm Jacob Aloysius Sebastian Hansel with the UW Lacrosse Biology Department. And I'll be presenting Rooted in Symbiosis, the Ectomycorrhizal Diversity in the Kikapu Valley, Wisconsin, with a special focus on Sugu Canadensis or Eastern Hemlock. Okay. First, a quick overview. We're going to go over some introductory information, so basically what fungi are and the basics of symbiosis. Um, and then we're going to go over ectomycorrhizal tree and fungal symbiosis specifically. And then from there, we'll go into Eastern Hemlocks. And then we'll go in a little bit why we chose the Kikapu Valley for this research. And then we'll be moving on to the methodology of the research and what results we have now, and then what we expect in the future, and then a quick conclusion, and then we'll have some time for questions. All right, so what is symbiosis? Well, symbiosis, if you look at the Latin of it, sim meaning together, biosis life, so living together. And this falls along a continuum. So it's not typically the shared environment we typically think of, it also includes parasitism. So it goes from being <clears throat> more of a positive for one organism to, with a negative to the other. So you can think of like tapeworms or ticks. And then on that continuum, it can go from really bad to start getting a little better to where we get to commensalism, where one organism benefits, but the other one really isn't bothered. So you can think of like bird nests and trees. And then that kind of continues on over until both <clears throat> organisms benefit, and then you have a mutualism. And that you can think of um, things like lichens and things like that. And there also is an obligate versus facultative measure to this. So for obligate, we have things that need to be with specific other organisms to actually live. This includes the trees and fungus that I'm studying, with lichens, it's the fungi and the algae, they cannot live by themselves at all, okay? And then with the facultative, we have more of, it's not so dependent on one organism and the other, it's more of optional. So we can think of birds, or not birds, but bees and flowers, or butterflies and flowers. The flowers can feed lots of different bees, different birds, different butterflies. They don't really care who they feed as long as they get pollinated, okay? And so some introductory information about fungus. Well, fungi are mainly composed of chitin. So you can think of the same thing that makes up like um, crab shells and lobster shells, okay? And believe it or not, the way most of us were taught when we were younger was that plant, plants and fungus were in the same kingdom. But we now know that they're actually more closely related to animals. So you and I are more closely related to fungi than fungi are related to trees, okay? And they have a very complicated life cycle, and this is a very simplified version of it, but they start life as spores. And those spores will land on a substrate, or you know, on the ground mostly. And if they have the right amount of moisture, and they sense there's some food there, they'll grow out and send out some hyphae, or their individual growing units. So one cell at a time, they'll grow out into the environment, and essentially just vomit out some enzymes. And then those digestive juices will pick up what they want to eat and they'll suck it back in and they'll continue to grow that way and that's how they grow and how they eat okay when you get a bunch of these hyphae together and they start forming mats they're called mycelium so when you peel off the bark off a log you see that nice white mat of fungus that's the mycelium you're seeing and the mycelium actually composes the most of the organism than any other part of it and so when this mycelium gets growing and it has enough food it has enough water it'll begin its reproductive cycle once it finds a suitable mating pair. So what they'll do is they'll start growing a little mushroom, and when it's grown, there's a little tiny pin, that's all it is, is just this little tiny thing, and it's already completely formed. And all the mycelium does is pump a whole bunch of water into it, and it forms the mushrooms that we're familiar with, or a fruiting body. 
Okay, so that's, they're mainly water, so that's why when you pick a mushroom and dry it out, it shrivels up so much, okay? And then once the fruiting body is out, it drops its spores, and then the life cycle begins all over again. Okay, so how diverse are fungi? Well, right now, there can't, we, this is the easiest way to break them up. So we have, in the most basic part of it, we have kitchen mycota, which if you know what fog, frog chytrids are, they're actually um, a parasitic fungus that infects frogs. And with this phyla of fungi, <clears throat> this is where we actually learn they're more closely related to animals because they actually have a flagella. So a little tail at the end of their cell. And we all began as a, well, a single cell thing with a tail on it um, at one point in our existence. So that's kind of the link between fungus and animals is animals and fungus both have those attributes at some point in their life cycle. Okay. And then you move on to zygomycota, which you think of like bread molds. Okay. And they tend to reproduce mainly asexually. So they don't really need to mate. So like the most of that dusty mold on your bread is actually just asexual spores. And then moving on, we have glomeromycota, which make up the bulk of the mycorrhizal community. So all the grass, the maple trees, most of the vegetables in your garden, except for cabbages, for some reason they're squirrely. Um, but these um, are fungi that are essential to most plants because they form a similar relationship to what we're studying and we'll discuss in detail tonight. And then we go on to ascomycota, which start getting more familiar. So we think of like morels and elf cups. Okay, and they have, they're called sac fungi because what they hold their spores in when they're sexually mature is just a little sac, and when they're ready, the little top will pop off and spread some spores. Okay? And then there's basidiomycota, or what you think of as your typical mushroom. Okay? And they're called basidio because they have what the spores are held on is like a little club. And there's four little spores hanging off it, and when they're ready to go, they'll pop off and go off in the wind. So now that we got kind of the basic stuff, I'm assuming we all know what trees are, so I shouldn't have to cover that. Um, we'll get into the ectomycorrhizal tree and fungal symbiosis. And they have been best buddies since the Permian. So the late Permian, early Triassic period is when um, gymnosperms or pine trees and that family evolved. Okay? And then these fungus co-opted with them and then slowly throughout time later in the Triassic and Jurassic periods, they ended up branching out into flowering plants as they evolved as well. Okay, so what does ectomycorrhizal mean? Well, if you break down this Latin term again, we have ecto, which means outside, myco, meaning fungi, and then rhizal, meaning root. So fungi that grows on the outside of roots. Yeah. So in this symbiosis, what happens is the trees will photosynthesize and create sugar. So they'll capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, take a little light from the sun, break some water in half, and then go ahead and take all that energy they harvested from that and actually create the sugars that the whole entire tree is made out of. Okay? And so those sugars will flow down the tree into the roots, feeding the tree on the way down. And once it gets to the roots, it'll allocate some of those to the fungi that are growing on the roots. In exchange, those fungi grow out into the soil because they can grow faster and they have smaller filaments than the trees can, <clears throat> the trees can produce. And so from there, they're able to absorb water and minerals for the tree at a faster rate than a tree could ever do on its own, okay? And this exchange between the water and nutrients and sugars can be totally lopsided. The tree can barely give any sugar to the fungus, and some days the fungus barely gives anything to the tree. It depends a lot upon environmental conditions and things like that, okay? So now we kind of got this basis down, we can talk about what kind of trees are involved with this. So all the trees, in the Pinaceae family, or the pine family, all the trees in the Betulaceae, which is the birch family, and the Phagaceae, or the beech and oak family. Now, all the trees in these families are completely obligate. They have to live with ectomycorrhizal fungi. They will not grow without it. And then there's some trees in different families that are they're less numerous, so we have Silaceae, which is the willow family, and in that is included as poplars and aspens, which are particularly in that group. Willows are kind of back and forth with that. It depends upon how close they are to water and certain species will participate in the symbiosis as well. And the Malvaceae, which is the mallow family, so you can think of marshmallow, well, that's the same family as that. That's where we have our basswood trees. Okay? And then Juglandaceae, or the walnut family, you have things um, mainly hickories and pecans. 
that will participate in this. Not black walnuts, they don't like ectomycorrhizal fungi. And then there's some herbs and, <clears throat> herbs and shrubs as well, but they're not so well known and it's not really a subject of my research. So what are some of the characteristics of these trees? Well, when they're growing, they form short, multi-branched root systems. And on these short, fine roots, that's where the fungi will actually attach. And what they'll do with their roots, they'll actually modify the soil around them, creating a rhizosphere. And we'll get into what a rhizosphere is in a second. And like I said, they're obligate symbiotes. And one of the ways we found this out was when people started planting pine trees from North America to Europe. They were not growing well, and they didn't know why. And then some guy went, hey, what if we put the fungus with them? And so they planted the fungus with them and they took off. And now it's so bad in some parts of Europe that those pine and spruce trees are actually taking over places and becoming invasive. Okay. So I had mentioned the rhizosphere. What is the rhizosphere? Well, that's, you can think of it as the root's microbiome. So inside of you, in your gut, you have a bunch of bacteria and archaea and some fungus that help you break down the foods that you eat so you can get adequate nutrition. They're all over your skin. You have little mites in your face that only live on your face. It's all a symbiosis. It's a microbiome, okay? So what the tree will do, it'll extrude some sugars and proteins and different minerals out into the soil to actually um, promote healthy microorganisms. And then that also triggers ectomycorrhizal fungi to attach to the root, okay? And this helps guard against pathogens as well because those healthy bacteria will outcompete ones that could be possibly pathogenic. Okay, so now that we kind of understand the biology of the trees, let's, what do we use them for? Well, a lot of our timber comes from ectomycorrhizal trees. Your house is probably built out of pine two by fours, you know, oak cabinets, you know, hickory handles. These are a lot of common woods that we use to build a lot of our structures. Okay. And also they provide food. If you like acorns, you can make some acorn pancakes. Everybody, you know, some good hickory nuts on the side, even hazelnuts. Okay. And they provide, a, uh, they provide a vital habitat for all of our favorite woodland creatures. So either through hunting or observing nature, we gain that benefit. And one thing in this day and age that's very important is carbon sequestration. So through that process of photosynthesis, as they capture that carbon dioxide to build the sugars and build themselves, that carbon is actually locked into the tree as long as that tree is alive, okay? And another thing they do is they help improve water quality and quantity. So as that healthy rhizosphere, as it modifies the soil, all those healthy microorganisms actually make the soil fluffier and better at holding water and it slowly percolates through the soil instead of running off. And this helps to refill aquifers. And one thing that is noticeable around here was that when Wisconsin was first colonized, one of the first things they did was come through and cut down all the trees. And the Kikipu River was deeper then. And so after they cut down all those trees, the springs actually drained down because there wasn't that good, healthy soil and those roots holding it into the hillsides. And this has been a problem around the world, and there's a lot of... Um, research into figuring out how to improve the water quality through planting more trees. So now that we learned a little bit about the trees, let's learn about the fungus that are involved with this. So most of the fungi that are involved, they're basidiomycota or those club fungi, your stereotypical mushrooms that you see and everyone knows and loves. And some of them are ascomycota. You can think of like morels and there's ones that look like elf cups, but they're slightly in a different family. And there's some debate whether or not morels are actually mycorrhizal, but you know, it goes back and forth, the debate is quite big on that. And there's some of the zygomycetes, not very many of them, but those bread mold fungi do occasionally participate in the symbiosis. So what do they do? Well, when the fungi germinates, it'll form a mantle on the fine root. So all these images here are all images of those fungi growing on the fine roots of trees. And this is actually what we're looking for in my research. Okay. So what they do, once they attach to the tree, they'll go out and explore the soil and get those nutrients and water. And another benefit is, is that they'll form a communication and a nutrient exchange networks. So if one tree is not doing so well, if it's in the shade and another tree is connected to that tree through the fungus, they can actually give them some of their sugars. They can send chemical message between each other. If one's getting attacked by bugs or something like that, they can tell the other trees, hey, I'm getting eaten, and those trees and those plants will have a chance to make more protective chemicals to prevent them from getting totally eaten, okay? And these are obligate symbiotes, so you cannot 
grow this fungi by itself. It has to grow on these trees. So when we think about um, delicate mushrooms, like truffles especially, it'd be great if we could cultivate those on our own and not have to go forage for them. But you cannot get those to fruit unless they're attached to a living tree. Okay. So what do we use these fungi for? Well, there's over 900 species of ectomycorrhizal fungi that are used for food, including truffles, and there's lots of boletes and different amaceous species that we can use. And they're useful for medicine. A lot of compounds that we use for in the pharmacological, pharma, eh, pharmacological industry come from fungi. So a lot of the antibiotics, the anti-cancer drugs, and immune suppressing drugs for those who have organ transplants. Um, and there's more and more research going in to try to find more of these chemicals that the fungi produce that can help us live better and healthier lives. And they improve the soil quality. And so as they're going out through the soil, they help loosen it up and they put nutrients out in the soil and help decay organic matter and put more input into the food web so smaller things can eat and eventually build up into bigger things. Okay? And that falls under the habitat modification as well. And another thing they do is when they're alive, they're car sequestering carbon. So as that tree pulled that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, made it into sugar and gave it to the fungi, well, that fungi holds it in the soil. And if that fungi is deep enough, not a whole lot of things will eat it and it'll hold it as a carbon store in the soil. But on that same coin, some of these mushrooms are extremely deadly. Um, things like the destroying angel are some of the most d deadliest mushrooms in the world where if you eat just a few bites of it within 36 hours, there's no hope for you ever living again. Okay. So now that we kind of got the symbiosis, we understand the trees and the fungus, let's talk about a specific tree, the Eastern hemlock or the science name is Suga canzadensis. Okay. And Suga is Japanese for tree, Suga and Ga mother. So the mother tree. Okay. So we're going to go over some history some habits of the tree and the threats it's currently facing. Okay. So this tree is in the pine family. It's a pinaceae tree and it prefers the cool, moist soils. So that's why we tend to find them on the northern sides of the hills around here, around the Kikapu, because that has nice, sandy, cool, well-drained soil and the river helps cool off the ground as well. And they're widespread. So from basically north, east Wisconsin, all the way to the Atlantic coast, you can find hemlock groves between here and there. And they have very close relatives that live further south in the Appalachian Mountains called the Suga Carolinia or the Carolina Hemlock. And these trees are ectomycorrhizal. They're obligate to this symbiosis. Okay. So their life cycle, well, they're very long lived trees and they grow at variable rates. So you can have a tree that's 300 years old and, you know, three, four feet around, whereas and right next to it, you'll have a tree that's only maybe, you know, six inches across and that tree's 200 years old. So because they grow in a very different environment and they actually modify their environment to a great degree, but their long life shows that the oldest estimated one that we found is 988 years old and that's in Pennsylvania. But on average, they'll live four to 700 years. Okay. And what I mean by them being a keystone species, they actually create a habitat that only they can live in. So once a good hemlock stand gets established, other trees, so like oaks and maples, cannot get established because there's so much dense shade. And because these trees are the most shade tolerant tree in North America, they're really the only tree that can grow under themselves. Okay. So where do we find these in Wisconsin? Well, mainly up north with a nice, cool pine habitat. It's a lot more moisture up there. And you know, they just find those conditions better. And so when you get south of the tension zone, which is this imaginary line that geologists and climatologists have drawn across Wisconsin that separates this cool northern habitat from the southern dry, like hardwood habitats that we find around here. Okay. And when you get south of this tension zone, hemlocks become more rare. They actually start forming relics. So in the past, when the climate was cooler, they were a lot more populous around here. And as it has warmed up over the centuries, these trees have become less common further south. So what have these trees been used for? Well, in the past, these trees are used for making tannin or, you know, the necessary ingredient for tanning hides. So people would go out, cut the bark off the tree 
cut the tree down and peel the rest of the bark off. Or sometimes if they were jerks, they would just peel off as high as they could go and leave it. Um, so that was a very important part to it. And there's some timber value too, especially when there was railroad. The railroads were being constructed. This is one of the favorite things to use, make railroad ties out of because they hold those spikes very, very well because of the way the grain on the wood is structured, which on the other hand, that grain structure kind of prevents them from being used for structural timber uses. Okay? And another thing, they're edible and medicinal. So if you make a tea out of the needles, it has a lot of vitamin C. So if you find yourself not getting enough vitamin C and on the verge of scurvy, have some hemlock tea. That'll fix you right up. And for hundreds of years, people have been using the antiseptic qualities of hemlock so that all that tannins, you can actually help clean wounds and keep, stuff, keep infections down. So now that we understand a little bit about the hemlock, what kind of problems are they facing? Well, 20, 30 years ago, nobody thought this tree would ever go away. It was of least concern. But now, in the last 10, 15 years, we've had introduced invasive insects that have come in and actually decimated the populations in most of the East Coast. Um, one of the, the main of these is the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid. Okay? So what these little bugs do is they'll s plant themselves at the base of the needles and suck all the sugars out of the needle as it's sending it down to the rest of the tree, and the rest of the tree starves to death. Okay, once these get established, it's very hard to get rid of them. There have been lots of campaigns with different pesticides and different um, bioremediation and different biological controls, like introducing different insects that actually eat these. And one of the interesting things about these insects is that they actually don't need to mate to reproduce. They're parthenogenic. They can reproduce asexually. And the bad thing about that is, in North America, they cannot actually complete their full adult life cycle because they need a certain kind of spruce. Like in Japan, they would use a tiger tail spruce. But those trees don't exist here, so they actually, when they get to the adult stage, they just fly off and die. They can't actually lay eggs. And there's another kind of insect called the hemlock elongate scale, which is just a bunch of little tiny insects that will eat up on the needle and then cause the tree to eventually die from that. And one other thing that they face is habitat loss, either through climate change, because they like that cool, moist soil, so as the world gets warmer, it's gonna start losing that habitat. And humans are just as bad at destroying habitat as anything else. They'll, you know, when you go out and build a nice million dollar home on top of a hill that's full of hemlocks, you're destroying that habitat, or mining companies blowing up a whole mountain just to get some minerals out of it. Okay, so now that we kind of understand the organisms involved in what we're doing, Let's talk a little about the Kikipu Valley, okay? And the Kikipu Valley is very unique, not only geologically, but ecologically, okay? So these are probably things that we're all familiar with, but the, the name Kikipu comes from the Algonquian, the one who goes here and goes there. It's named for its winding nature, okay? So if you were to go from north of Wilton all the way down the Wisconsin River, it'd be about 60 miles. But when you canoe all the way down that river, you're going about 126. Okay? And it drains about eight, 810 square miles, and it's fed by many numerous cold water springs. So that helps keep the river cool, and that provides the neat little microhabitats that allow the hemlocks to grow here. And how did it get this way? Well, it's called the Driftless Region because it didn't get glaciated during the initial, um, during the last glacial maxima. And that served as a refugia for plants and animals. So all around it, there were nowhere where plants and animals could live and grow, but this one little spot actually held on to some of the biodiversity that was there before the glaciation happened. And it actually went around this area because when the first look, because just like how water wants to flow downhill down the easiest path, so does ice. So when it came down, it dug out that softer bedrock between the Mississippi and the Red Rivers, so what you think of Minnesota. And then as the next lobe came down, it carved out that nice soft bedrock around the Great Lakes. And then subsequent sheets that came down followed those low spots that were laid down the first time and it allowed it to go around the driftless region. And one of the more interesting things is, is this has never been studied for ectomycorrhizal fungi. No one has ever done a study like this out here and that makes it a little more interesting, a little easier to do some research out here. Okay? So, the research area that I'm working in, so it includes Wildcat Mountain State Park, the Ho-Chunk Reservation, the Kikipu Valley Reserve, Tunnelville Cliffs, 
So that area is about 30 miles, and then we added an additional point later on in the research at the Wilton Hemlocks, which is just between Ontario and Wilton. It's owned by the Mississippi Valley Conservancy. And one of the great things about Wildcat Mountain State Park is it has a virgin stand of timber. So it has one stand of timber that has never been cut. And that maybe provide a, um, <clears throat> a refuge for the mycorrhizal fungi that lived there, but maybe have gotten lost because of the deforestation and then the subsequent use as farmland and grazing lands. Which kind of brings into why the Kikipu Valley here, we have multiple points of comparison from <clears throat> completely virgin timber around Mount Pishka to all the way down to what is the Kikipu Valley Reserve, because we know what happened there in the 60s and 70s as it was a dam. They were gonna build the dam and then it just kind of left and lingered and now it's conserved. And then you have something more recent like Tunnelville Cliffs, which we can use all these points to compare how the fungi have either survived through different time periods or have spread from the older growth down through the rest of the valley. And this can help point out limitations in fungal dispersal. So if you're, if you're a mushroom fruiting on one side of a river on behind a hill, your chance of getting around that hill and further down the valley are pretty slim. Whereas, or even in the case of truffles, those rely on small mammals to find them and eat them and poop out their spores. Some of the research into truffle diversity has actually come from people running around collecting chipmunks and then um, analyzing their poop for spores. All right, so now that we understand why this research is going on and what we're doing, let's talk about how it gets done. So this is the methodology in my research, okay? I couldn't help it, I had to have a meme. Okay. All right, so the questions I'm asking here is how does ectomycorrhizal diversity vary in the Kikipu Valley? And we predict that it varies according to soil conditions, land use history, and conservation, so both past and present. So how people have cared for the land or the few hundred years that we've been here. Okay, so when we started this, the ideal situation that I wanted to do was to do 30 plots on each side of the river, um, but um, due to, well, time constraints and the fact that this is ancestral homeland of the Ho-Chunk Nation, we wanted to be respectful of their historical and their sacred sites. So we went, went through the DNR, the Ho-Chunk Nation itself, the KVR, and Mississippi Valley Conservancy to make sure that we were not disturbing any of these historic and sacred sites. And so 20 of our sites were immediately abandoned. They landed on top of an archeological site and working with the UW La Crosse Archeology span Department, we were able to actually make sure we did not land on top of one of those sites. And of those 40 sites, we ended up getting out to about 23 of them, okay? And we tried to have it spread out. We focused a little bit up around Mount Pishka because not that whole entire area was conserved. Part of it was grazing land at one point. You know, only one small patch of it is actually an old growth forest. And we spread that down, tried to keep it even all the way down to the valley and down the tunnel bill there. And then we have two sites, well, three sites that we picked specifically for Hemlock, but two we did differently. So right around Billings Creek and then south of County Highway P off the old 131 trail are two stands of, or two good stands of Hemlock and so what we did is we actually did a different kind of survey for those ones because we wanted to get an idea of how healthy these trees community were. And actually one of my undergrads canoed all the way down the river and counted all the hemlocks that she could. Okay, so how did we do this at each site? Well, 21 of the sites, we basically made a 25 meter circle and then count in, on the center tree, we used an ectomycorrhizal tree. So often it was an oak or a pine. A couple times it was a hickory. One time it was a basswood. But what we did is we measured that out and we divided it into four quadrants so that way we could see how it varied within the plot when we took our soil samples. And also it makes it a little easier to count the trees and write them down if you do them in quadrants. Um, okay. And so what did we do here? Every tree that was greater than five centimeters in DBH, so about that big around, we gave them all a hug with some measuring tapes. And the ones that are, I found that if they're bigger than 52, I can't get my arms around them. So when they're really big, I kind of got to swing the tape and try to catch it, okay? And then the 10 largest trees, we measured their height, and then we took readings with a densiometer, which basically is a, mirror, a concave mirror that you look up look at and you can count how many points in that field of view are covered by tree leaves 
or in the case where it's really dense, you count the ones that are, you can see light through. Okay. And then we looked at the herbaceous layer, so the little things growing on the ground, and the shrub layers. We found a lot of things that have thorns. Prickly ash is particularly popular. Okay, in our hemlock-specific sites, the two that were on Billings Creek and um, just south of County P, we can't be, oh, well, I totally didn't type that out, right? Well, they ended up being 50 meter by 200 meter plots because usually from the cliff face to back, they never went further back than 20 or 30 yards. Um, but we submitted it as that just in case. And then in that spot, all hemlocks that were bigger than five, we measured every single one of them in that area. And then also, like I said, with my undergraduate student, she went out and counted all the hemlocks from just south, right, where is it? Yeah, just south of Ontario all the way down to Rockton. And we'll get to how many she counted here in a moment. Okay, so how do we do our soil sampling? Well, at each site we did 10 cores, and those cores were determined by random vectors, so a distance and a direction. Okay, we used a random number generator and then just went out and took the samples. Okay, but at hemlock trees, we wanted to characterize their community of each individual tree. So we actually took four cores around each hemlock at two meters out one way and one meter out two other ways. And we just kind of rotated it between east, north, south, east, and west. So what did we use to get our soil cores? Well, we used a 15 by five centimeter or a two by seven inch soil probe. And it was nice I had a hammer on it because some spots were pretty sticky. But in between each soil sample, we took the probe apart, we cleaned it, and we sanitized it with 70% ethanol to make sure we weren't spreading d diseases between the trees. And what do we use these soil, the soil for? Well, three of them we used for soil analysis. And three other ones we're going to use to actually look for the fungi on the roots. And then we'll have four in reserve, mainly in case we mess up and then also in case anyone wants to do future research at the school with it. So what did we look at? Well, the first thing we did is looked at bacterial community composition. So we had some fancy ecolog plates which have 31 different food sources for bacteria. And so we took the dirt, kept it nice and clean, didn't touch it, didn't do anything to it. I made sure everything was clean and sterile before I touched the dirt, and then we basically swirled it around in some water, diluted it a whole bunch, and put it in these plates and read them with a fancy little laser beam reader. Okay, And then we also did soil texture. So we used about 15 milliliters of dirt, shook it up some water and some chemical compounds that helped separate it, and then we could see how much sand, silt, and clay were in each sample. And then we sent off soil samples to Madison for soil chemical composition. So how much carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, magnesium, zinc, all those little elements are in it to see if that makes a difference in our ectomycorrhizal fungi diversity. And they should be back around the 10th, I hope. All right, and so what are we doing with our roots? Well, those cores that we're using for the roots, we're gonna sift out the dirt and collect the roots. So we're gonna rinse them off in some water and look at them under a microscope and then figure out if there actually are ectomycorrhizal roots, and those ones that are, we're gonna cut them off and prepare them for DNA sequencing. And there's this fancy book by, um, by Greer that he's actually like one, of the, one of the utmost experts in ectomycorrhizal fungi, so there's like a stack of books that big that have all pictures of all of them in there. And they're like $700. All right, so <clears throat> what we're gonna do with those, um, those root tips Basically, we're going to extract the DNA from them. We're going to subject them to poly polymerase chain reaction amplification, which basically means we're going to stick it in this solution that will make a whole bunch of copies of the DNA. So that way we can um, use it to see what plant species and what fungal species are there. And then we'll pre prepare them for Illumina sequencing, which is one of the newer next generation sequencing techniques. Because it can actually, you can actually read every single organism inside of a sample instead of doing it one at a time. So it saves us a huge amount of time and a lot of money. Okay? And then to do that, we'll have to send them off to Madison. And, you know, that'll take a little while. So what have we found out so far? Okay. So the trees per site varied quite a bit. Um, not only because a lot of our sites are in the KVR, but um, Tunnelville only had four sites. KVR had eight at least, and Wildcat had six. So they had a lot more trees. 
than most other sites. And if we broke this down by individual um, plots that we used, um, the ones around Wildcat tended to be a little more thicker and there was some around more in the Ho-Chunk Nation part of it that was there were more trees per site than any other. Okay, so what tree species would we find? Well, our most commons were maples, obviously. They're everywhere. Um, when I made a graph for this, I actually had to take maples off of it because it skewed it so much you couldn't see the other trees on the graph. Okay, but outside of that, hemlocks, obviously, because we targeted those, and white pines, basswood, hornbeams, and ironwoods, hickories and oaks were the most common ectomycorrhizal trees. And there was some yellow birch, typically with the hemlock communities. There's a few elms, some box elders, and then you know, a decent amount of wild cherry. Okay. So the average diameter at breast height per site was biggest at Wildcat because it has that older growth of forest. Okay. And then next, between Tunnelville and Wilton, um, Tunnelville had some larger pines and some larger oaks, and the KVR number's a little bit lower because it had a lot more sites, but there are also sites that are a lot younger because it's only been conserved. Some spots have only been conserved for the last 20, 30 years that haven't been used for things. Um, and then the Wilton Hemlocks is about similar. Okay, so in our Hemlock community, thankfully we found no Willie Adelgid or Elongate scale, so it has not crossed over from Michigan into Wisconsin yet, at least this part of Wisconsin. And my undergraduate counted 7,661 hemlocks. And then of those, we measured 582. So average, they were about 27 or 22 inches, about, or 22 centimeters, about nine inches across. And that puts their average age between 60 and 100 years. And there's such a wide range to this because hemlocks, like I said, had that variable growth pattern. And the only way you can really tell is by sticking a core through them and we didn't want to damage the trees in any way. And also, because there actually is some hemlocks that skip years on growth rings. So this is stuff that they found out. So it makes it kind of hard to tell how old they actually are. And our biggest one that we found was about 35 inches across, just under three feet. And that puts it at about 150 to 250 years old. It could even be older. It could be pushing 300. Okay, and our soil texture. Most of the, surprisingly, most of these sites or not surprisingly, we're loam, sandy loam, and silt loam. A lot of the clay settles down into the valleys, okay? And these sandy, loamy areas are what is conducive to hemlocks growing, okay? And our bacterial diversity varied a lot. And then some of the plots, when we put this into different graphs, we found that the ones on the east side of the river were more diverse than the west side of the river. And it was actually, <clears throat> and it goes, the Kikipu Valley had, the KVR had the most diverse, it's followed by Wildcat and then Tunnelville and Wilton. So what do we expect in the future from this? Well, we're gonna do our DNA analysis. So we're gonna determine where, what fungi are there and where they're at, okay? And then maybe we'll discover a new species because this has never been studied here before, okay? And then once we finish getting our soil analysis back, we're gonna use that to test our predictions on whether or not soil conditions affect where the fungi are. And then lastly, we're gonna take all the data that we can find about land use and use that to determine how that has played into how, that, the, how the fungi have spread or have lived throughout these different conservation practices. So, so what was I talking about again? So, ectomycorrhizal trees and fungi are vital for healthy forest communities. And this has never been done in the Kikapu Valley. No one's ever come out here and tried to do this. And eastern hemlocks are a near-threatened keystone species. And the distribution and diversity factors will help us improve conservation, not only here, but around the world. And if we discover new species, it'll help us build our understanding of how plants and fungus have evolved. And some acknowledgists, my advisors, Dr. DeBellos and Dr. Osmondson. And in addition to them, my graduate community consists of Dr. Kerr and Dr. Bunbury. My undergraduate researchers, Sam Nelson, Zion Wallace, and Chris Edmont. I wouldn't have been able to do this this summer without them. And then for our site approvals, Bill Quackenbush, the Ho-Chunk Tribal Historical Preservation Officer, Matt Zion at the DNR, Wendy Holtz-Leith at UW La Crosse Archaeology Department, and then Jason Lees from the KVR and Abby Church from the Mississippi Valley Conservancy. 
Our funding came from the University of La Crosse, Wisconsin Research, Service, and Educational Leadership Grant, and then also from the, the University of Wisconsin La Crosse Health and yeah, College of Health and Sciences Dean's Distinguished Fellowship. So now we can have time for questions. Um, so a lot of them, if, you, if you've noticed mushrooms growing around it, so around oaks you'll find um, especially um, a lot of agaricus or amicia species. So if you think like those ones that pop up and they have a nice little skirt on them and they pop out and they're nice and yellow, we found a bunch of those this summer. Um, you can take those and let the spores spread to where you're planting other oak trees. Or if you have the means, you can take soil cores of it and then take those soil cores and plant them with your other tree to kind of inoculate the soil with them. So is this method being used by tree uh, plantations? Uh, typically what they do is they'll get the fungus out of the soil and then they'll try to culture them in some way. Um, a lot of times we can get them to grow to a plate and a lot of those that actually work are patented so I don't know what they actually are because you have to pay money to figure it out. Um, but then they'll actually take that, take a little plug of that agar and stick it with the tree when it grows. Or oftentimes if they can't do that, they'll just collect spores from the, um, from the macro fungi, from the fruiting bodies and spread those out so they have a chance to grow. Yes? So based on that answer, I'm assuming that means that the fungus isn't as sensitive to its environment as long as the tree's in. So you don't have to worry about soil type or bacteria or other things, the fungus will exist pretty much anywhere if it's got the right tree adjacent to it or you don't know that yet? Um, with, in the confines of this valley, not really, but as far as it goes, they will be more productive in certain soils so the tree can actually choose which fungus it wants. If the fungus is giving it something that the tree wants, then the tree won't give it any sugar and it won't grow. Um, and on the same hand, um, if that fungus doesn't grow well, so there might be some bacterial pathogens that are in that patch of soil that could affect how well that fungus grows. And if it can't grow well, that tree is not going to want it for its buddy. Yes? Um, the soil samples that you took, were they right at the surface? Or did you, how deep down did you go to get those? We only went down seven inches. And that was all of them? Yeah. Yeah, so we only went as far as the probe would go. Um, one, we didn't, it would lessen the chance of having a disturbance of any sites. And two, we just wanted to keep it consistent and look at that top layer of soil because a lot of it underneath that far is, gets into hard sandstone. There's a few times where we can only get three or four inches in before we actually hit that sandstone. Yes? Is there any, any common Uh, well, there are certain species of fungus that will only grow on certain trees. So if you think of certain boletes, like the chicken fat ones, uh, so around white pines, you'll see these yellow ones with little bit of spots of red on them. Those only grow with white pines. They will not grow with anything else. Um, other ones are kind of fat, so they'll be not quite so picky. So like the amanita, like, um, like destroying angels and... Um, there's yellow ones, I can't remember what the name of them are. They tend to prefer oaks, but they can grow with other trees. And there are certain species of truffles that only grow with pines or grow with hemlocks or grow on oaks. So there is some specificity there, but there are some generalists as well. Yes? I don't know if you can answer this, but I'm most familiar with Wildcat Mountain State Park and like in the mountains, the hemlock park of the state forest. I've always found it interesting there are also some places in Wildcat Park itself proper, but you have the hemlocks that are growing right down there along the river. Mm -hmm. But then you have another strand of hemlocks up at, Mount, uh, at Little Mount Pisgah. Yeah. And I've always wondered, why do we have hemlocks that are that far distance from the river? Do you have any theories on that? Do you think it's because the cool, water, cool air comes up from the river? Because you can actually see the river from there? Do you think that it's got similar soil top types down by the river as up there? 
Um, the similar drainage is a big issue, a big cause of it, and also because um, the way the stands grew originally, it was a solid stand at one point. So those trees were able to stay alive at that point, and the ones that are up there tend to be older ones. Um, that's, we took actually some soil samples around. You're talking about the ones that are kind of towards the top of Little Pishka, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah, we took some soil samples around those ones to see if something was different with those. Um, we haven't gotten to those ones yet, though. And then you could also sample the uh, hemlocks right behind the maintenance building at Wildcat, because that's another area, and that I have no idea why they're growing there. Well, let me pull up that. All right. So kind of what we'd so like little pish guys look right in here. So we got on this side of it. So actually we centered it on a really big oak tree that was right there in the very edge of our research, of our area was right at the edge of that hemlock stand. Um, but we didn't go closer into the park. We kind of just wanted to keep that there. But there was lo there's lots of hemlocks. There's over 2,000, 3,000 hemlocks just right in here alone in this little bend of the river. My undergraduate research actually got overwhelmed trying to count all of them. Um, that's when she decided to go down the river on the kayak because that's quite the hike. And I think she ended up walking like eight miles that day. Yes? So um, I, uh, I, took a, I got a lot of uh, oak trees from the county. Yep. And, and uh, uh, a marginal success so far. But they're all planted in what would have been uh, fields. Yep. Um, uh, and it was organic for a few years, so that's a good thing. But um, is there something that we've learned so far that would tell a person if they're doing a, a oak plantation, say, that you would do to contribute to this, uh, uh, this ecosystem? Yeah, um, so one thing that there are certain specialists in this field that actually um, go into more of the arborist part of it and actually help design um, different fungal methods of um, getting those ectomycorrhizal into the soil. Um, actually, our newest uh, mycologist at UW La Crosse worked with um, inoculating pecan trees with pecan truffles. So not only could they help the trees grow better, but actually have a secondary crop to the pecans. And that's something that you can do. I think there are some commercially available inoculum. So things you can actually put in the soil that, that will help the trees. Or if, when you go on a walk in the forest and you're near an oak tree and you see some mushrooms growing up, you can grab some of those mushrooms and go take them and just let, this, and just let it sit there so the spores will spread out and then that will have a chance to actually get to the tree. So there are a lot of kind of, like you can have some do-it-yourselfer ways, you can order some of this stuff on the internet and then other things you can consult professionals and then they will kind of tell you the best way to go about it for your specific tree species and location because if something's been a field for a long time, there hasn't been a whole lot of trees there to keep them alive. Yeah. 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 This is fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? So in my yard, I'll see different years, different mushrooms popping up around the trees. Yeah. Yep. And why are they different? Um, yes, because different fungi have different conditions for fruiting, and also because some of them just only fruit once every 10 years, some fruit once every five years. There are some that we don't even know if they fruit at all, um, because just we haven't seen them, or no one's just been out there to see them. Um, some of the more common ones, too, are in the Russella, are, you know, kind of like wine caps, where if you pick them up, they kind of crumble. Those tend to be a lot of popular ones that we see because they fruit a lot. Whereas other species, we, there's, there might be species we don't know about, like there's some chanterelles that only grow once every five or 10 years. And there's some that we just never may have known because if you don't go looking at the roots, you might not know they're there because you just didn't happen to walk by to see that macro fungi at the time. What about the Indian pipe mushrooms? Oh, I was gonna bring that up too. So what um, ghost pipe and, um, yeah, Indian ghost pipe and um, bear corn? are two good examples of this, but they're actually mycoheterotrophs. So what they do, so myco meaning fungus and heterotroph just meaning they don't use photosynthesis. So like we're heterotrophs, we eat things, we don't make our own energy. Um, so what they'll do is they'll actually, they'll actually attack the fungus that grows on the trees. So they'll take the ectomycorrhizal fungi, so they'll indirectly take the sugar from the tree, the sugar will go from the tree to the fungus, and then they'll steal that sugar from the fungus to grow. Are they parasitic or are they? Yep, 
They're parasitic plants. So they lack chlorophyll, that's why they're white, or the bear corn's yellow, because they don't do photosynthesis. So they get all that food from the fungus that gets their food from the tree. So yep, essentially. So, uh, um, so the, the fu uh, fungus that grow on trees up above the soil, yeah. any, any uh, thing, how do, they, do they tie into this at all? No, if they're growing on the trunks of the tree or on the branches or anything like that, aside from lichens and moss, okay. um, they're actually decaying it or hurting it. Um, a lot of the times if a tree has an open wound, the fungus will be able to get into it. Um, that was a big problem with the American chestnuts. And because oh, yeah. um, there was a standby, uh, actually one of my advisors, Dr. Develos, that was her doctorate work was studying American chestnuts. And she did a lot of work by West Salem with those trees. And she was actually trying to see if they could in inoculate a virus into it to kind of keep it from killing the tree. Um, but like if you see um, like honey mushrooms and stuff like that on a tree, typically that tree or um, chicken of the woods, stuff like that, it probably means that tree is going to die soon because it's eating out the inside of the tree. Yeah. And th there was a few spots that we found this summer where, oh, where was it? It was actually out by the Wilton site and we found... There's a 20 foot log and the whole entire thing was covered in chicken on the woods. It was really cool. I didn't take a picture of it, but I was like, eh. Actually, I should have taken a lot more pictures this summer. I never did because I was too worked up and trying to make sure I did everything right and took all my notes right and everything. So I ended up with not a whole lot of pictures. Okay, so you just said something that's interesting because I always had the theory that um, the, the uh, mushroom fungus was just taking advantage of the fact the tree was deteriorating. But you're suggesting that the, they contribute to the decline of the tree. Yep, some of them can. Some of them are all. Yep, not all of them, but yeah. they basically are just opportunistic. Yeah. Um, and there are certain species of fungus that will actually just kill a tree. So um, sudden oak death is a fungus that will actually um, get into the xylem of the trees, which is the, the, the cells that actually conduct water from the roots up to the top of the tree and it'll actually get in there and plug it, and that's why you'll see the trees, the oak trees just dying like that. Um, Dutch elm disease is another fungal disease of trees that are spread by the little bugs, the yeah. Dutch elm bugs. I can't remember what they're actually called. But those are other examples of it. There are a lot of uh, fungal pathogens of trees, and they treat, and they've co-evolved back and forth with it. And the reason why like Dutch elm disease and sudden oak death are so deadly in America is because the trees that are here did not evolve with those pathogens. So like they don't have any resistance, whereas they're in their native range, the trees that are there aren't so bothered by it because they actually have defenses that they've evolved because they have spent their entire evolutionary period with these pathogens. The same reason why like when we get certain diseases, we don't, like when we get colds and flus and you know, back in the day when people got smallpox, it didn't really hurt Europeans, but to the Native Americans, it decimated their population because they didn't evolve with those pathogens. Yes? It's probably just a matter of time until the global ideology gets here. Is there anything that can be done about it? Uh, if it's caught soon enough, um, it can be um, treated with pesticides. There are certain pesticides that you can give to the trees. Um, they kind of discourage the aerial dispersion, but they're, I can't remember what it's called, but there's a kind that you can actually put in the soil that the roots will pick up and help contain it. But once it gets established and starts spreading, it's really, really hard to stop because all they need is for a bird or a squirrel to kind of come by and pick up little crawlers. No, these are how they actually spread. So inside this wool is the adelgid that's you know, um, laying eggs parthenogenically, just asexually reproducing. And these crawlers will crawl out and they'll crawl around the tree. And so when a bird lands on it, they'll stick on the bird's foot and fly off to the next hemlock. And if it's windy enough out, they'll blow off the tree and land on another tree. So like if you can catch it early enough, it's, there's been um, evidence that they can kind of prevent it from happening. And there are a lot of research into finding um, hemlocks that are resistant to this. And there's some limited success. They found a few, um, oh, how's the word? I want to say phenotypes, but that's kind of a big word. So they found some um, hemlocks that are, that are, eastern hemlocks that are starting to show resistance to the woolly adelgid. And so they're trying to get those to, um, they're trying to propagate those so that way we can start planting those to help take place of the ones that don't have any resistance. So they're non-native, right? Yes. 
But the hemlocks are already getting resistant. Yep, there are some of them that they're finding that are becoming resistant to them. Yeah. Okay. Preliminarily, anyway. Um, so I recently moved down to like Gates Mills, the Copper County area. Yep. And um, I'm not sure, but my impression is there's not as many hemlocks down there. Did you do any soil samples down that far south? Uh, no, we did not. Oh, wait, hemlocks are down here. All right, so there are some down further south along the Kikapu down this way, so kind of towards Soldier Grove. Um, we did not, we kind of limited our research area to just in Vernon County here. Um, one, because, you know, I only have like $3,000 to work with. And, um, you know, in one summer, it was enough trying to get those 23 spots because um, that, that took us all summer to be able to go out, because it takes a long time to go out and count trees and measure them. Um, usually it took us about two to three hours per site just to get um, the trees measured and um, counted. And then for the soil cores, that took an additional hour or two. So we actually did them in two separate um, th goes. Yeah. So uh, um, because these populations are kind of isolated, yeah. there's some unbearable range, right? That are, are they... Are, is there a diversity in these populations that they're uh, uh, they're almost different? They're different genotypes, or uh, yep. know, right? Um, and is that a danger for them? Um, so that's one of the reasons why we're going to do why we did that four-way sampling on the hemlocks is to make sure that we got made sure that we got DNA from those individuals, and so we can actually compare that to other DNA they've collected on in northern Wisconsin. And there's been a lot of the research in Michigan and Pennsylvania where they've actually taken the genome, and they found a lot of the hemlocks this far west tend to be very inbred. So there's not a whole lot of genetic diversity within them because they're isolated. And the ones down here especially, um, we're not entirely sure because no one's ever taken DNA samples from the trees around here. But um, we can almost assume that due to the limitations in pollen dispersal, there's not a whole lot of pollen coming from northern Wisconsin or you know Michigan making it all the way down here. So they're... Okay, so then this is, I could ask questions. Oh, that's fine. So um, most of the hemlock are like above the tension zone. Yep. But, uh, there, this pocket down here, um, it is true that zone four is kind of a slice of in there, uh, and so it's, it's yep. cool temperature in spots. Uh, but why, why here, uh, um, you know, since it's well below the tension zone? So they um, tend to be relics. So oh, they're relics, right? Yep. And so, so they're in those pockets, those draws, mm -hmm. there's less sunlight. Okay. Yep. So they tend to be in those cooler spots, but also, you know, a few thousand years ago, the climate was cooler. So the hemlock range was actually greater back then and through just the natural cycles of us warming since the end of the last glaciation, the habitat is lost and that's why instead of being widespread, they're just found on these cool northern cliffs. So that means also then the fungal uh, varieties that they depend on, that's pretty fragile too because that's going to disappear if the hemlock, right? Disappear. Yep. And that's why so we're trying to... Yeah, in the same sense, yes. Um, that's kind of why we were um, focusing on hemlocks too, especially in this area, because once again, these ones have never been studied. So these might actually have unique sets of fungi that go with them um, because they've been so isolated. Yeah. So you were just doing this this summer? Yeah. Um, and you now are you going to the lab or doing any yep. more research? Yep, um, right now, it's more of a scheduling issue, getting my undergrads on the same page to get um, the DNA stuff done. But we've done all, all the soil testing preparation. So I've done all the bacterial diversity stuff. I've done, um, gotten all the soil samples off to Madison, did all those um, soil textures, which is very time consuming because you sit there and you shake it for two minutes and then you let it sit for 30 seconds. And then you pour it off into another tube because the sand will stay in the first one. And then you gotta wait 30 minutes for the silt to settle out. And then you dump the rest off and then you measure how much is in each tube and then you subtract that from 15 and that tells you how much clay was in there. So yeah, that, that was the fun part. But then with the soil samples that we sent off for chemical analysis, um, we actually had to um, bake those at 120 degrees Fahrenheit for 40 to 72 hours so we could crush it into a fine powder. 
And so I sat there for quite a few hours with a big giant motor and pestle and crushed up dirt and sifted it. Now had to be sifted through two millimeters or less. Luckily it was dry this summer, so not a lot of our samples were muddy. <laughs> it was the one benefit of it kind of being a dry summer was that we didn't have to deal with wet samples. But then again, that also affects what fungi are available too, because if the trees are gonna select for more of the ones that have the better water caning abilities versus nutrient abilities. Mm -hmm. So we think that may be a factor in also what we find from this summer. And part of what the data we're gonna gather is, um, I'm gonna use, well, I was a meteor, like I said, I was a meteorologist in the, in the military. So being able to analyze um, weather rate, archived weather radar to see what the precipitation patterns have been for the last year, to see which areas have gotten what much rain, we can kind of line that up and see if that plays a factor in what we find as well. Yeah. Here we go again. All right. So <laughs> at the beginning of your work, um, the drought hadn't taken full effect yet. Yep. By the time you were done, we're in this ultimately extreme drought, whatever mm -hmm. they want to call it, um, right? Did you see a shift? in the nature of the, the fungi in that period? Uh, we haven't gotten to actually figure out what fungi are in our cores yet. Oh, okay. And we took yeah. all those over a two week period in um, mid-August. Oh. So, so you might have a study, somebody will do a study and show you all wrong because it was a rainy year. Instead. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we could find totally different yeah. diversity on the trees if it's yeah. a wetter year or if it's a cooler year or you know, if there's a certain insect that's pestering the trees that year. Um, there's so many different factors and they've found, um, they've actually done studies where they planted like a spruce in the ground and then pulled that spruce out after about a year or two and then took very careful care and took all the fungi off the roots and they found that it varies just as much along one string of root as it does for the whole entire plant. So a one tree can have, you know, a couple hundred different fungi living on it at one time just in like three foot of its root. So that diversity varies so much. Yeah, it could be entirely different. So if we come out, you know, if we get money or someone else gets funding to do this again and it's a wetter year, they'll find a different level of diversity than what we found. It could be more, it could be less, it could be relatively the same number wise, but just more diverse in general. And some of the, so I know you had mentioned something about those um, communication and nutrient yeah, sharing networks. Too, yeah. yeah, and one of the more inter interesting studies that they did is they actually took in the lab, they planted like a birch and a pine tree next to each other and then put like a maple tree in the middle. And they took on the, actually it was a fir tree. And they took a tent and put it over top of the fir tree. And then on the birch tree they took and put little tents that had carbon that was slightly different, so like carbon-14, radioactive, and they could actually see, they put radioactive film, or just photographic film, and they could actually see those sugar molecules moving across up into the tree. And when they measured the, the carbon in that other tree, they found that there was carbon that was only given to this tree that was found in this tree. So that's kind of what the basis of that research has been, that idea of the wood wide web and all that. So did you, did you, have you heard of, uh, they, did they find other trees setting insecticide out to their young, specifically their young? Um, that's young? kind of still up for debate. Um, okay. That was kind of where people were leaning in over the last like 10 years, but the last couple years there's been a few research, a um, few people doing research that kind of disprove it and, and you know, kind of say it's more of just a random distribution, okay. if at all. Um, okay. Because it's just, they kind of question some of the earlier studies and they're like, well, maybe this doesn't quite make sense. Um, so it, this all was, with all science, basically, you're just trying to disprove what was done before. And if you can, then you build up a better theory and hypothesis out of that. Yeah, you're welcome.